This morning I would like to discuss with you what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What exactly does that mean? Will you turn your Bibles with me please to Acts 16, verse 31. Acts 16, verse 31. This message is going to be in two parts. I will not cover everything that I planned on saying in all of this this morning. I will come back, Lord willing, tonight at 5.30 and we will finish this study. But I'll tell you this, it, um, it may answer some questions that you may have concerning uh, salvation and I assume that most of us are, are saved and in the kingdom of God. But if you're not and you're visiting, we'll be glad to discuss anything with you that maybe you haven't heard or been taught or believe. But I will tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, I do not want you to accept anything that I say just because I say it. Will you please open up your Bible? See it with your own eyes. Hear it with your own ears. And understand it with your own heart. Will you please do that today? I believe that's what God wants of us. Let's take the Bible and see what it says. Accept what it says. Obey what it says. Practice, promote, preach, and teach what it says. You'll be in good shape then. This Philippian jailer was fearing for his life in Acts 16 because after this great earthquake that happened in Philippi, God shook that Philippian jail and the bands of these prisoners broke loose. And all of them, of course, were free at that point. They could get up and move around. And he figured that out because after he awoke, he saw that the prisoners were loosed. He almost took his life. And you remember the Bible says, Paul said to him, Do thyself no harm. We are all here. And he called for a light, the Bible says, and he came running in to where Paul and Silas was, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's his question. Now look at Paul's answer. Brethren, there in verse number 31, they said, that's Paul and Silas, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Do you see the answer? That is the greatest answer to man's greatest question about Jesus Christ, greatest news. We have to start with Christ. The Bible says that the Lord is the way of salvation. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Him. John 14, 6. That's what the Bible says. Jesus Christ said that. However, when you look at the passage, there's controversy surrounding this great New Testament passage of the Bible. Why is that? I believe sometimes that's the way it is because folk go to the passage and refuse to look at several other passages. Please keep this in mind. Not one simple passage that we understand in the Bible contradicts any other passage or scripture. It doesn't do it. It is constant throughout. It's consistent. It is inspired by Almighty God. It is the Word of God and not a bit of it stands in contradictory to another part of it. So if you and I look at what all the Bible has to say about what to do to be saved and then we conclude, based on the evidence that we have, we'll have all God's information on what it takes to be saved. 
the gospel of peace and the gospel of grace and this gospel of salvation is for all men. But not all men are in the same place when it comes to understanding the Bible. I want to note this first of all with you. Acts 16.31 connects to the great commission that Jesus Christ instructed his apostles and meant for his church to continue with. You have that passage marked Acts 16.31. Turn your Bibles with me now to Mark 16, 15, and 16, please. Let's look at this passage. We'll put it in its context and then look at the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Following the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, He was upon the earth about 40 days before He ascended into heaven. When he first started his ministry, he instructed his apostles, Go ye into the household of Israel, the lost sheep. He did not want the gospel to go beyond that point. That is what is called the limited commission. The Jewish people were not right with the law of Moses. So John the Baptist came, preparing the way of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ came, began his uh, public ministry, had his apostles sent out two by two, going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, instructing them the kingdom of God is at hand. After Jesus was put to death on the cross of Calvary, and right before he ascended to heaven, he said to those apostles, verse 15, Go ye into all the world. Do you see that? And preach the gospel to every creature. That's what he said. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned or condemned. That's what he told them right there. Question. Is Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi because of preaching the gospel? Yes, they are. And you know what those two men were doing at midnight? They were singing praises to God and praying to God after being beaten with stripes and put in prison. I want us to put ourselves in their shoes just for a moment. What would we have done? Would we have cried, Lord, why is this happening to me? Why all this pain? Why all this anguish? Why am I going through this? I'm a servant of yours. Why this? And we could ask the question all day long. But ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ suffered. Jesus Christ died. Are we greater than our Master? If through this life we suffer because of righteousness, shouldn't we suffer through it? Shouldn't you and I be like unto Jesus Christ our Lord? And shouldn't we continue to follow in the paths of righteousness and preach and teach the gospel to the lost? That's exactly what Paul and Silas were doing. Now here's a man that he's broken he wants to know what to do to be saved. Well, he went to those two men that had the right answer. But he had to start somewhere. And they started with belief in Christ. And there's where salvation starts. That's where it starts, right there. So this passage in Acts 16, 31 connects to Mark 16, 15, and 16. And what the book of Acts actually does is it shows us the record of salvation as the apostles and the New Testament prophets are going through the book as we read and study about them. They are teaching and preaching the gospel. People are hearing the gospel. 
And people are obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no way. We can look at Acts 16.31 and separate it from the Great Commission. It, it is linked together forever. Now let's look at another example. In my mind, I think it's one of the greatest examples in the book of Acts. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8, please. And look at this passage together. Acts chapter 8. Here's a great example of a man from Ethiopia. Ethiopian eunuch, as we have often heard of him. Traveled a thousand miles from his home to Jerusalem for to worship God. He was returning home. And he was reading from the prophet Isaiah, a scroll that he had in his chariot. He didn't understand the subject or the person about whom Isaiah had written. The Spirit of the Lord said to Philip, you go join yourself to that chariot. And the Bible says that Philip ran. See, he was interested in getting to this man because this man's soul was still lost and in need of salvation. And I think that should be a lesson to the church of Christ. You and I must run to these folk out here in the world lost in sin, ladies and gentlemen, because one of these days the Lord will call us into account at that judgment. And if you and I have done everything in our power to see that we're striving to live faithfully to God and we're striving to reach those lost people, we are like Christ. And we're not until we do. Don't you want to be like Jesus Christ this morning? Don't you want to live a righteous life? Don't you want to seek the lost as Paul and Silas in Acts 16 and Philip in Acts chapter 8? Philip's excited about it. He ran to the chariot. He heard him read from Isaiah. Here's the question Philip asked the eunuch. He said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, how can I accept some man should guide me? Isn't that us? When I took interest in Jesus Christ, I didn't know all the answers. I asked questions. I had to study it out, figure it out. That's what it takes. This man was honest enough to say, I need to know who this is. So he asked the question. Of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? And the Bible says in Acts 8, and verse number 35, Philip opened his mouth, began at that same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, do you see that? Preached unto him Jesus. Where does salvation start? It starts with the same person every time. Did not Paul and Silas say to that Philippian jailer, after he asked the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Did they not start with Jesus? Believe on the Lord Jesus. Where did Philip start? He went to the Old Testament. From that passage, and he preached to this Ethiopian eunuch, Jesus. Do you know why? Because Jesus Christ is the Savior of all the world. That's why. There's where we start. There was a lot of information in that. There was a lot. It's implied. There was a lot of communication between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. From that passage of the Bible, it must be implied. Must be. There's no other way to conclude. Here's the reason why, brethren. Verse number 36. They went on their way. See, they're still traveling. You know, I don't know if Philip really meant or intended to go to Ethiopia. I don't guess he did. But if it would have taken that entire trip, 
to show this man about Jesus Christ. I believe Philip would have ridden those thousand miles if he had to have. This man needs salvation. Let me, ta let me take and invest my time, my energy, my talents to get to this man and teach him about Jesus. The Bible says as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Is that what he asked? What doth hinder me to be baptized? The Bible says that Philip taught him Jesus. You're not going to teach a person about Jesus and leave out the command of baptism. This man was inspired of Almighty God. And he taught him Jesus. And the eunuch is asking the question, what's hindering me to be baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He answered him and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Isn't that great? The great confession. So not only did that eunuch believe, he confessed. And the Bible says in Acts 8, he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. He went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch was a saved man by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That was a great day, wasn't it? Great day right there. Can we disconnect Acts 16.31 from Acts 8.35 through 38? The answer to that question is no, you cannot. They are forever connected. Number two, Acts 16.31 is connected with other what must I do to be saved passages or equivalent. What must I do? I've heard people over the years say, well, you do not do a thing. It's all the grace of God. It is the grace of God. It also takes faith on the part of man. And friend, faith that demonstrates itself to God is a faith that is obedient. Three times the question is asked, what must I do? If you'll turn your Bibles with me, I want to show you in Acts 2. Turn with me, please. Acts 2. I want you to see this with your own eyes, hear it with your own ears, understand it with your own heart. What does the Bible tell us? The book of Acts is the history of conversion in the first century. It shows us what people did to be saved. Now, if we come all the way down to 2019 in Jacksonville, Florida, do you think that remains the same as it was in the first century? And friend, let me tell you, it absolutely does. Jesus Christ the same today, yesterday, and forever. That's what the Bible says. There's no change there. If you and I obey the gospel that was preached in the first century and revealed right here in the Holy Bible, we become exactly what those folks were. And what were they? They were New Testament Christians. The Bible says in Acts eleven twenty six 26, that those in Antioch, we're called Christians first, right there. And what a privilege and blessing it is to be a Christian. I'm glad I'm a Christian. I want to follow Jesus Christ today. I want to be saved by His blood today. I want you folk saved by the blood of Jesus Christ today. Let's reach out into Jacksonville. I didn't know that Jacksonville was as big as it was or is. 
I tried to travel Wednesday about 15 miles. I thought, well, I can leave here and do this in about 30 minutes. That's what I could do where I'm from or less. Well, that 30 minutes turned into an hour. I text Brother Victor. I said, Brother, I'm going to have to figure this traffic out. I said, there's a lot of folk down here. And they seemed to go about the same time I decided to go, and we all can't go at the same time. <laughs> so my father-in-law drove me to church this morning, and I was well on time. <laughs> so he might have to keep coming with me. <laughs> Let me put this passage in its context, Acts 2. This is following the ascension of Christ back into heaven. And the apostles now have this commission, you take the gospel to the world. And the Lord meant that, brethren. He meant it. He means it today. We do not have a red light. We have a green light. And green light is when you go. And what did he say to them? Go ye into all the world. And you preach this gospel. Note that every creature... Every person, every man, I do not care where he is, where he's from, his nationality. He has a soul. He's created in the image of God, and God wants him saved. He wants him saved now and prepare himself to go to that everlasting uh, home of the soul, heaven. That, I know you want to go to heaven, don't you? That's why you're here. You want to go to heaven one day. You might live upon this earth 75, 80 years. You might be thinking, well, that's a long time to live. You ask somebody 75 or older right now, how long has it been? I'll, I'll know what they're going to tell you. It seems short. It seems short to me. I'm glad that heaven's not like that. You and I get to heaven. That's forever and ever. Don't have to worry about that. That's the place I want to be. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, the apostles had convinced the Jewish people there in Jerusalem on this Pentecost that they, by their wicked hands, they crucified and they slew the Lord. They were pricked in their hearts. Um, if you come on down to verse number 37, when they heard this, the Bible says they were pricked in their hearts. And they said unto the men and the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? There's the first time the question is asked. What shall we do? Now, what, what, what did Peter say? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is what they were told. And you know what they did not do? Do I have to be baptized? They didn't ask that, did they? Did they get mad? Were they sad? When they were instructed by these inspired men, if you come on down to verse number 41, here's how they received the Word of God. The Bible says, Then they that gladly received it. Now there are folk who gladly received the Word of God. And that's the way we should receive the Word of God, gladly. Sometimes folk just want to be in opposition to what the Bible has to say. Look, friend, this book, it's been here long before you and I ever discovered America. It's true now. It's true when it was finished in the first century. It'll be true on out into eternity. And we should gladly receive the word. And the Bible says there was about 3,000 added unto them. Wasn't that a great number? About 3,000 people that day. Honest souls, repenting of their sins and being baptized, washing their sins away. The Bible says in verse number 47, they praised God. 
They had favor with all the people, and the Lord added them to his church. Is that what your Bible says? They added, he added them to his church. That's what it says, Acts 2, 47. First time it's asked. Another time. If you'll turn your Bibles to Acts 22 and verse number 10, you'll remember this man, Saul of Tarsus. The Bible says of him that he made havoc of the church, Acts 8, 1, persecuting the church, hailing men and women to prison, those who are followers of Jesus Christ. He was on the road to Damascus, he saw a light that was above the brightness of the sun, knocked him down. He heard a voice coming unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. What would you have me do, Lord? Acts 2. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Saul of Tarsus, Acts 22.10, what would you have me do? Acts 16.31, the Philippian jailer, sirs, what must I do? Those are the three times. But notice this, brethren. This is really not hard to conclude. Every single time the question was asked, there was a different answer given. Philippian jailer was told to believe. When Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus, he was told to be baptized. In Acts 2, the Jewish people were told to repent and be baptized. Why do we have those varying answers? Is the Bible inconsistent? Is God a respecter of person? Acts 10, 34, 35. He absolutely is not. So why does that seem like different answers for different people? The reason is because the people were in different places. I want you to suppose that I start out from here and I want to walk, say, to Orlando. I just start out walking. I get about, I get about 10 miles close uh, to my destination. I stop and I ask, how far is it to Orlando? Someone says 10 miles. I keep walking. I stop and ask, how far is it to Orlando? Six miles. Keep walking. How far is it to Orlando? A half a mile. Did I receive three different answers? Do you know why? Because every time I was traveling closer and closer and closer. Question. Did those people on Pentecost already believe? All right, so what did they lack? Repent and be baptized. What did Saul of Tarsus lack before Ananias got to him? Had he already believed? What would you have me do, Lord? That's Acts 22.10. Did he already confess? He called him Lord. Had he repented, he went three days and three nights without food or drink. What do you think? What did he lack? Ananias came to him. Why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. That's what Saul of Tarsus did. Now question, what did this Philippian jailer know? 
I dare say to you, he'd never heard the name of Jesus Christ. So you're going to have to start with belief in Christ. Tonight, Lord willing, we're going to demonstrate that Acts 16, 31 also connects with verse 32. And we'll pick up our study from that point and carry it on out to its conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, one passage of the Bible does not contradict in any way any other passage in the Bible. When you put it all together, you have the complete story of what Jesus Christ wants us to do. Have you ever put a piece of, uh, have you ever put a puzzle together? You've done that before, haven't you? You put it all together at the same time. You're piece by piece. You ever taken a journey? You do not travel all of it and just one fails. You take the steps. In the church of Christ, we talk about the steps of salvation. Do you know why? Because steps are needed. If you this morning believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you're heading in the right direction. That is where the Philippian jailer had to start. If you have repented, and that's the tough part, that's the part right there. It's hard to get folk to change. But if you and I change from that old person in that old way because we want to get over where Christ is in righteousness, there's a lot of things I'm going to have to change and turn away from. And that's exactly what the Lord wants. If you've confessed Christ before men, and been baptized for the remission of your sins. The Lord's added you to his church and you're in a saved condition if you're faithful to God. But ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't done that, I would urge you this morning to do just that. Almighty God loves you. He sent his son to this earth to die upon the cross of Calvary to save your precious soul. And he's calling out through you, to you this morning through his word and through this gospel. 